All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unit 5. Uh, we are covering all of the major revolutions of this time period. This is a time of general upheaval. So where are we going to start? Obviously, the Enlightenment. Here we go. We the people. Just like the Renaissance and humanism, the Enlightenment is a time where we emphasize reason and logic over religion. If you know anything about religion, it's about faith in the unknown. Enlightenment is the opposite of that. It's a time where we need to have something concrete. This occurs during the 1600s and the 1700s, and it's going to spur these new ideas of natural rights, natural rights, which are things every human should have. Something John Locke defines as life, liberty, and property. It also brings up this idea of separating the church from the government. Why is this important? Why do you need to know this for the exam? Because it comes before all the revolutions we're about to learn about. There were all these uh, pre-existing governments in place and these ideas come about causing people to question the power structures that existed. They want to change, hence the revolutions. One of the things that spurred this enlightenment idea was that this, this 30 years war, where Emperor Ferdinand II became head of the Holy Roman Empire and while everyone had freedom of religion, he forces everyone under him to be Catholic, which causes the defenestration of Prague, which is just when the nobility of Bohemia and the Czech Republic pushed Ferdinand's representatives out of a window. This was covered a little bit in the last, um, one of the last PowerPoints. Why is it called defenestration? And the word is spelled D-E-F-E-N-E-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-N. Because the word literally, fenestration, simply means the windows and doors of a building. That's it. This starts and it opens a revolt. And here we go into the 30 years war. This war lasted from about 1618 to 1648 and was just a fight between Catholics and Protestants. And more than 8 million people died, all because people wanted to practice their own form of religion. So do you see why people wanted to separate the church from the state? Makes a little bit more sense now. All right, so people like John Locke and Montesquieu come up with these revolutionary ideas. You can see where these ideas end up, and I hope you're seeing the documents that shaped America right now. We actually took the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness basically from Locke. Well, okay, we changed property to pursuit of happiness, but we certainly got life and liberty from him. And Montesquieu's ideas of separating legislative, judicial, and executive is how we have the balance of powers today in the United States. These new ideas come about right before we have our revolution right here in this nation. These thinkers support reason over faith, natural rights of every human being, the idea of anti-absolutism, anti-slavery, and anti-serfdom, and wanting to expand suffrage. We have to make a caveat though. They did indeed want to expand suffrage, but to all men. Most men could not vote because the idea was that they were poor, did not own land, and maybe they couldn't even read. But there wasn't this popular idea of expanding suffrage to women. That would not come until much later. There will be a push by women in the 1800s, and we will get into that, but Enlightenment thinkers, well, they weren't that enlightened. So let's look at this question. Can a ruler be all into absolutism and still be enlightened? So we're going to look at Catherine the Great. We touched a bit on her during the last unit because of the Cossack Rebellion and how her predecessors were trying to westernize Russia. She was into that as well, with wanting to enlarge the territory of her country, fund the arts, and spread Western ideals. And yet, despite all these reforms, she kept feudalism going. There were still serfs around. Aristocrats still had power, and when she saw what was happening in America and that glorious revolution, which remember was a bloodless revolution in England, but still allowed for the power to be essentially stripped from the royal family, she realized that the more she let the West in, the more of a chance she had of being usurped from power and having to be made into a puppet monarch. She couldn't let go of what she had. <clears throat> So, in her heart, could she truly ever be enlightened? Sure, she thought she was, but she wasn't really. She wanted to please those that would keep her in power, those that have money. She wanted to keep her power because 
frankly, who wouldn't? So let's look at this little revolution over in France, shall we? France was split into three social classes, which were called estates. You will hear about the third estate a lot. So just remember in your head that estate equals class of people. The first estate is the clergy. Those are the religious people. They're the head of the church types who are 1% of the population and they own 10% of the land. A clergy person doesn't own the land, but the church owns the land. 2% of the population are the second estate and they own 25% of the land. They are the rich nobles. The middle class peasants and city workers, essentially everybody else, round out about 97% of the population and they own 65% of the land. It seems a little off, sure, but it's not terrible. If you have more money, it would stand that you would have more land, right? Okay. So what causes this uproar over in France? <clears throat> First, you have the American Revolution, which you know a lot about by now. And if you don't, you'll learn a lot more in American history. I can also give you more of a lowdown before and after school. But essentially, they went against my people, the British. This inspires all these ideas of democracy and a democratic republic was born. This was the model of all revolutions. It will be held up as the ideal one for all time. Countries that revolt today are still looking to the American Revolution. Another cause is the Enlightenment, of course. People start quoting Rousseau's social contract where he said that monarch monarchs didn't have the divine right to lead, but that the people did, that people must have the right to choose their own laws. They quoted Voltaire, who actually, side note, did mock Rousseau for the record, but he did so under the guise of freedom of speech, which is what people advocated for. He also advocated for separation of church and state, and the freedom to practice whatever religion a person wanted to practice. The third estate, remember, 97% of the population started to demand equality, liberty, and democracy. A third cause was money problems. So let's go back in time to France. France had actually helped America during the revolution, but as a result of losing money and America couldn't pay it back yet, the king, Louis XVI, wanted to raise the taxes. So he called a meeting of the Estates General. The Estates General, this is a term you're going to want to know, is an advisory body of representatives from each estate that had no real power. They met every so often until 1614, and then they were never called again until 1789. So basically, the king never really used them. And they had no power. Remember, they were just an advisory board. So each estate gets one vote. Think about that. 1% of the people get one vote. 2% of the people get one vote. 97% of the people get one vote. Clearly this isn't fair. So the third estate said they had enough and they decided to break away and form the National Assembly. They decide it's time for a new constitution. July 14, 1789, the peasants stormed the Bastille prison as a means to look for supplies to defend themselves. And as a result, the prison falls. And this symbolizes the start of the French Revolution. This is actually called Bastille Day today. So if you ever hear about Bastille Day, that's what it is. The third estate group that had their own governing body, the National Assembly, come up with their own declaration and pass it on August 26th. It was based on ideas from the Enlightenment thinkers, and you will read it if you haven't already, and you will compare it to the American Declaration of Independence if you haven't already, depending on when you watch this. You can see so many similarities because if it worked for one nation, it would surely work for another. Granted, in the time since their revolution, this is just a side note, France has had 16 constitutions while America is still working on their original, but it's hard to copy a masterpiece. So we know what leads up to this. What does Louis XVI do? Something foolish. He refuses to accept a limited monarchy like those in Britain did. So groups like the Jacobins, a group that wanted to execute any and everyone that supported the kings, went a little nuts. This started what is known as the Reign of Terror. From September 5th, 1793 until July 28th, 1794, there were 16,594 official death sentences with 2,639 in Paris alone. 
The leader of the Jacobins was this guy named Maximilian Robespierre. I'm probably saying that wrong. It happens. He and they wanted to get rid of all the royal family because they were the old regime. So both the king and his wife were executed. Also, no, she never said, let them eat cake. However, was she sympathetic to their cause? No, she was not. In total, approximately 40,000 men and women were executed. And as we know from our lesson on Oliver Cromwell and Pugachev, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this was the case with Robespierre, who was executed for being just much too radical. The idea of moderation came into play. So here we have Napoleon, and he gets some ideas from Alexander the Great. Remember that Alexander built one of the largest empires in ancient history. He was around during the 300s in the BCE era. He wasn't the only leader that inspired Napoleon, but he was one of the greats. So Napoleon is out to do the same. He seizes control of France in a military takeover, a coup d'etat, and starts this new form of leadership called popular dictatorship. You may also hear the term benevolent dictatorship in reference to him. The idea is that he is an absolute ruler, but that he is doing it in the best interests of his people. Granted, any dictator would think they're making decisions in the best interests of their people, but we'll get into that in a minute. He says that he's going to bring order to France that has been in crisis, and he promises that he'll, that he'll do it in 10 years. This sounds really great, so of course people jump on board with him. His goals include solidifying Catholicism as the main religion and bringing back the church hierarchy and bringing about an equality in the law code. This protected your property, but women were still denied most of their rights. He declared himself as an emperor and France became an empire in 1804. You're probably already seeing issues with this because didn't enlightenment start with this idea of separating church and state? And the enlightenment was one of the causes of the French revolution. And, and here's this guy bringing the Catholic church back into power in the government. It doesn't seem to make that much sense. He has plans to dominate all of Europe, and he starts to win many battles, but he makes what amounts to the largest mistake in history. Something that everyone knows is a very bad move. He invades Russia. Granted, some before him have made some moderate success in invading, like the Mongols in the 1200s, the Ottomans in the late 16th century who destroyed Moscow, and Poland who managed to gain some land in the early 1600s. But Sweden tried in the early 1700s, and they failed. Russia was ready to not lose again, so Napoleon comes in and fights for five months. He is convinced that the Russians are working with the British and manages to capture Moscow. And the Russians' way of dealing with this man and his people that won't leave? Whew! Scorched earth policy. They just burn Moscow down. If the Russians can't have it, no one else can. It's the same thing you do when you have a sibling who steals one of your things. You destroy, decide to destroy that thing. Because you think if you can't have it, neither can your sibling. In 1814, Napoleon has to abdicate his throne by a coalition of European forces. They all come in, and they're just tired of France basically dominating all of Europe. He even says, hey, my son can take over. And they go, uh, no, we don't want you around at all. So he is forced to go live on the island of Elba uh, after the Treaty of Fontainebleau is signed. You don't really need to know how to spell that, but in case you want to know, it's F O N. T-A-I-N-E-B-L-E-A-U. However, in 1815, he escapes. He goes back to France, gets some loyal followers, and becomes emperor again. But it's only for 100 days, when he's defeated the Bottle of Waterloo, which is a song by Abba. He was exiled once again, dies in 1821, probably of stomach cancer, but some think he was poisoned. He was buried there, but then later brought back to France and buried with other military leaders. Why do we care so much about him? Because this guy awakens feelings of pride in their nation and the growth of nationalism. Nationalism is gonna have an uglier connotation a little later in time, but for right now, during this period of time, it's a pride in your country. And a lot of these people didn't have a pride in a country because they weren't really joined together. He also wasn't as short as we like to say he was, because heights were a little bit different. You'll have to Google his actual height. He wasn't six foot something, but he also wasn't five foot two either. Look, all right, here we go. So Napoleon is down for the count and Europe needs to heal. Great Britain, France, Austria, Prussia, and Russia have to meet up. 
This is led by a group of conservatives who meet at what was called the Congress of Vienna. The goal was to restore the Bourbon monarchy and restore peace to the nation of France and all of Europe as a whole. They had to establish a new balance of power. So old ruling families had to come back and there had to be a sort of buffer between the major powers. So remember, the Enlightenment basically spurred all these revolutions. It removed all these powerful families and they decide, nope, we're going to bring it all back. So they put the House of Orange Nassau on the throne in the Netherlands. They expanded land in France. The Burmans come back to power in France and in Spain with legitimate rulers coming back to power in Italy as well. As a means to make sure Russia didn't become too powerful, they split up Poland between Austria, Prussia, and Russia, all while some of Poland becomes this independent kingdom with the Romanov dynasty of Russia as its hereditary monarchs. On top of all of this, the German Confederation was created in order to replace what Napoleon, Napoleon had put there. While this was all going on, by the way, the 100 days of Napoleon occurred, and as a punishment to the French people for allowing it to happen, they had to pay a sort of tax for what he had done, except an army that would occupy France for five years so it would never happen again, and had the borders of France returned to what they were in 1790. This basically stopped the conflict all going on, by the way, until 1914 when World War I started. This is what this Congress of Vienna did. This is why this is important. If you want to know the effect of the Congress of Vienna, it stopped fighting in Europe for almost 100 years. I think it was like 1818 to 1914. That's what a big deal this is. Another reason we mention conservatives here it's because the French Revolution really unleashed this idea of liberalism and nationalist forces. These individuals at the Congress of Vienna were conservatives, which was a sort of backlash to the liberalism, an idea that came about in 1790. I mean, conservatives came about in 1790, starting with this guy named Edwin Edmund Burke, E-D-M-U-N-D, -E sorry, Burke, and Joseph de Maistre, M-A-I-S-T-R-E both counter-revolutionaries and authoritarian conservatives. De Maistre believes in hereditary monarchies because of the order they bring to society. They, along with all the conservatives at the time, were against the idea of the middle class taking all the power in a sort of revolutionary power grab. And while some were okay with changing governments, they felt it should be done slowly and over time. So some, think about this, some conservatives were like, yeah, okay, I'm okay with power changing, but it has to be slow. It can't be done in these revolutions because, oh, America's just going to fail. That was kind of the, the thought. All right, basically, I just talked about this. This was their goals, prevent future French aggression, restore absolute monarchs to power, maintain the balance of power in Europe. They restore Europe to its pre-revolutionary status. Absolute monarchs were restored. They have this balance of power so that no one country would become more powerful than the others. And there was an alliance between Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Britain. And we have this idea of conservatism, which were wealthy people, against liberalism, European middle-class business leaders and merchants who wanted to give more political power to elected parliaments. These are the two ideas that we still have today. Here we go, nationalism, back to this nationalism idea. This is going to evolve, but at this time, it is based on a commonality, based on language, religion, social customs, and territory. And it is going to evolve into having borders and feeling more alike to people in your country rather than just people in your tribe. It will become more ugly as we go further on in time, but for right now, this is a very new concept. All right. As you can see with the before and after, there's a lot of change and a lot of countries created as a means to keep the peace. You can tell, and of course, if you want to pause this, take your time, look at the slides on your own time. Please take a chance just to look at how the borders all completely change. All right, now it's time for a deeper dive into nationalism. So before Austria and Germany looked like the countries they are today, they were groups of people in different sections. But they start to have a sense of being Austrian or being a sense of like German, and this leads to feeling national pride. So it's no different in Italy. 
Northern Italy is unified under a man named Count Cavour, while Southern Italy was unified under Giuseppe Garibaldi, who ends up joining the two. Because the Catholic Church wanted its own autonomy, they did eventually join, but they were the last to do so. There are problems that Italy has to face as an easy transition, of course, is hard to come by. It comes down to the cultural differences between the two. The South is poor and agricultural, while the North is more industrialized. Anyone with a working knowledge of the Civil War in America would see a huge similarity with these two nations. Should this ever come up in an essay, you could totally use those two nations as things you would compare. I mean, they're both very similar. All right, the first king of this unified nation was a gentleman named Victor Emmanuel. Just something of note, if you ever want to write anything about him, he had several children with several women, but the ones that were legally recognized later became, he had a king of Italy, a king of Spain, and one of his daughters married the king of Portugal. So just like Queen Victoria's offspring, Queen Victoria, by the way, is from England around the early 1800s, King Victor had his hands in many other nations just by virtue of his offspring. Essentially, during this time where everyone's being friendly, all these countries, the royal families of Europe were very much into marrying relatives. So the more you get to know, if you ever take AP Euro, or if you just decide to read some type of European history book, especially around the 1800s, a lot of these European royal families are going to intermarry. It was as a means to keep the peace, but a lot of these people, royal families even today, are still related somewhat closely before they got married. A little creepy, but it kept the peace. So Germany is also going to unify, and it's because of this guy named Otto von Bismarck and some war that we have that. He used the idea of real politics, which is sort of a pragmatism when it comes to achieving power. All countries essentially do this, doing anything they have to do to achieve and hold on to power. So it's a real good term to know, real politics. All right, it couldn't have been easy when there were 39 independent states that saw themselves as Germanic. Germanic, maybe saying that incorrectly. Anyway, some were Catholic, some were Protestant. The king at the time appoints Otto von Bismarck as the prime minister. And what does he do? He starts some fights with Denmark, Austria, and France in the Franco-Prussian War. It was, however, successful because it got the other Germanic states to see how powerful he was and to join up with him. So by 1871, 25 of the Germanic states join together. Wilhelm I is proclaimed the first German emperor in Versailles. Otto stays on as his minister president. Little interesting fact about Wilhelm is that he was a very polite gentleman whose wife was intellectually superior to him. And while he was a conservative, because obviously he wants this powerful position, she was a liberal and often persuaded him to her way of thinking, which many in his office saw as a weakness in him. Now we can't forget about our gunpowder empires from our last unit. The Ottoman Empire is struggling. The Balkan region of the empire, that's this area over here, is uh, destabilized by nationalism. They're seeing what everyone is doing and what they want to do with themselves. During the late 19th century, the idea of loyalty to the Sultan wanes in popularity. And now it's more popular to be loyal to your state. So they introduced the idea of Ottoman citizenship as a means to quiet the unrest so that all the diverse people will see themselves as a member of a cohesive unit. This, of course, is only going to last for so long, though. All right, it's time to cross the ocean to the South American revolutions. So you're looking at a timetable here. The American Revolution caused the French Revolution, which is going to most certainly be one of the causes of the Haitian Revolution. All three were inspired by the Enlightenment. All three were marked by social and political inequalities amongst their people. All three had people that were upset with a previous absolute monarchist rule and were inspired by the ideas of democracy, liberalism, and nationalism. So if you were comparing all three in a Venn diagram in the center, those would be their similarities. For Latin America, we have four key liberators that you should be aware of. If we were asking for direct evidence and you named a country or region, you want to name the person behind the liberation. 
Remember, you don't have to know all four, but it's good to know at least one of them. So if one of them calls out to you and maybe easier to learn, I'd learn about them. So for Haiti, it was Toussaint Levator. He was the leader of the growing resistance. He first fought for the Spanish against the French, and then he fought for the French against the Spanish in Great Britain. And then finally, he fought for Saint Domingue in the era of the Napoleonic France. He helped transform the slave insurgency into an entire revolutionary movement. It was really one of the most important revolutions to happen and one of the most successful. In the northern part of South America, you have Simon Bolivar. He was known as the Liberator. He was born into a wealthy family and was sent to Europe to be educated. But here's the deal. He was actually introduced to the ideas in the Enlightenment while he was there. So when he comes back, he's inspired to overthrow the Spanish government, and he essentially helps make Venezuela an independent country. And in Mexico, we have Miguel Hidalgo. He was the leader of the Mexican War of Independence. He was a priest who comes to New Spain, that's Mexico, sees the rich, so rich soil, and he teaches the people how to grow certain crops, only to find out that it was illegal to do so. These crops were for the Spanish to sell, which didn't make sense to him. There were people starving, and they could easily feed themselves, he thought. He marched and gathered poor farmers, and they managed to kill many Spanish men who were better trained than his poor farmers. But when you're poor and hungry, you have a cause. Then in southern South America, we have Jose de San Martin. He's known as the protector of Peru. He was studying in Spain and helped in a battle over there, and after that battle, comes to South America to help gain independence from Spain for the people there. Four different pieces of evidence you can use, four different individuals who did a lot for Latin America. So we have a quote here from Simon Bolivar's Jamaica letter. You will read this entire letter, um, if you haven't already, depending on when you're watching this, and you will analyze it. Bolivar was in exile in Jamaica when he wrote this. A little context, he actually admired the British parliamentary system and originally wanted a balance of power, although later he advocated for a stronger executive. The habit of obedience, a community of interest, of understanding, of religion, mutual goodwill and tender regard for the birthplace and good name of our forefathers. In short, all that gave rise to our hopes came to us from Spain. It was basically the same that the spirit for independence was bred from Spain. So to be angry at them would be ridiculous. It's as though a parent is mad at their child when their child grows up and craves independence. Bolivar wanted his, this huge country, by the way, but it wasn't going to happen. It eventually broke apart, and we had the independent nations in South America that we have today. There were geographic barriers that prevented this, large landmass from actually staying as one country, and the poor roads and the poor transportation systems they had in place prevented everyone from moving freely from one portion of the land to the other. So we also need to look at this Monroe Doctrine, which came from the United States. This was a policy and act that was aimed at to prevent any more European colonization in the Western Hemisphere, that the old world and the new world would say two completely different spheres of influence. If the old world should try to step into the new world and start a new colony, this would be seen as an act of aggression. It also was meant to stop the new world from being a battleground for the old world, going about fighting its issues over here. If you've ever seen Dirty Dancing, think of it as Johnny telling baby, this is my dance space, this is your dance space. This is essentially the same concept. So there are going to be problems for all these new independent countries. These new leaders, they all hail from military backgrounds. Carrera in Guatemala and Santa Ana in Mexico. They're concerned with personal power. So we get these dictatorships in these baby countries. I say baby in the sense of age rather than baby in the sense of size. So the economies of these countries are to stand still after um, independence. They start to get all these cheap goods, but this has a negative impact on their industry. There was a lot of political instability due to the cost of independence. Wars and a lack of a stable tax collection system, which, you know, happened in America with the Articles of Confederation, left the new nation states in tight financial situations. If you don't remember the Articles of Confederation? Please look it up. Essentially, after we declared independence and we won the war, we had these, like, articles that said, this is how we're going to run the nation. But it didn't really work, so we had to get rid of it, and that's how we wrote the Constitution. So, what were the effects of these revolutions? Slavery was largely ended between 1780 and 1890. Now, not completely. Obviously, we still have it in certain places today, but largely. And in some countries, obviously, it took longer than others for it to eventually end. 
we know America took another war for it to actually end. But the realization came that slavery was no longer necessary for countries to flourish economically. Also, the Russian serfdom system was abolished by 1861. So it took time, but change did happen. Women started to demand their rights, especially the right to vote. Feminism started to emerge during this time. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women, where she argues that women should have an education because they are essential to the nation. Women educate the children. They are companions to their husband rather than just a wife. And instead of just viewing a woman as an ornament or property, she maintained that women are human beings who are deserving of the same fundamental rights as man. Then we have Olympe de Gouges, which I'm probably totally butchering, and I apologize about that. She writes the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen, which was modeled after the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which was a document written for the French Revolution. She wanted to expose the failures of the French Revolution, but failed to get a lasting impact. As a result of her writings, she was accused, tried, and convicted of treason, which resulted in her immediate execution. She was one of only three women beheaded during the Reign of Terror, and the only one executed for her political writings. Clearly, this was an important piece of writing because it brought attention to a set of feminist concerns and scared men enough to get her head chopped off. The Seneca Falls Convention was put together by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott, at this convention, Stanton wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, which is based on the Declaration of Independence. It listed 18 grievances and 11 resolutions, demanding equal rights. Granted, women would not receive the vote to, a right to vote in the United States for another 72 years, but it was a step in the right direction. I'd also suggest that you should probably watch the movie Suffragette. It's about getting the right to vote in England, and it's a really good cast, a couple years old, and there's a few other movies that... Um, your teachers can also suggest to you. So Miss Nesbitt and I, so just ask us and we'll throw you in the right direction. All right, time for the Industrial Revolution. Yes, another revolution. This occurs around the mid 1700s in Great Britain. And if you had seen the opening ceremony of the Summer Olympics when it was run in England, uh, you would have noticed how much time they spent glorifying this. To be fair, it's kind of a big deal. Industrialization is a time when the machine starts to replace human production, resulting in concentrating production in a single location and leading to an increased degree of specialization of labor. So what contributes to this? You need to know this. Being close to water helped this start because waterways are still a big deal in transportation. If you have access to rivers and canals, you have access to ships. The ships carry coal, iron, and timber. If you're close to water, you're able to increase your agricultural productivity. You also had a time of legal protection of private property, so there wasn't the fear of someone to come around and take your land. There was access to foreign natural resources, and there was a large accumulation of capital. So we had transportation, natural resources, money, food, coal, iron, timber, and land. We were set to innovate and move forward. Technology starts to grow. The textile industry is the first industry to just go off. We're talking clothes and fabrics. Because this starts to grow, we need factories as a means to house the big machines, so the factory system emerges. Factories were typically owned by the very wealthy, and the very poor tended to work in them under the worst conditions. We're also going to have the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney. This increases the demand for cotton. He also invents a system of interchangeable parts. Before this, if your machine broke, that was it. It was done. You had to get a whole new machine. But now, if a machine broke, you could figure out which part broke, get the replacement part, and you were good to go. This made machines cheaper to maintain and thus keep the factory system growing. Then we get the invention of the steam engine. So if you're thinking about global warming or climate change or whatever we're calling it today, yes, the Industrial Revolution was the time when it all started. You, well, it's when it really fast forwarded it. You have to realize though that people were not aware that the burning of fossil fuels would cause environmental issues for years to come. So railroads, steamships, and the telegraph made exploration, development, and communication possible in interior regions globally, which increased trade and migration. Railroads are going to go throughout the United States, for example. They're going to go out throughout Europe. Steamships are going to make it so much easier to travel along the ocean. And of course, the telegraph made communicating across large swaths of land so much more easier than getting on a horse. Other innovations include the smallpox vaccine. It came out in 1796. Uh, Edward Jenner observed milkmaids who had previously caught what is known as cowpox. 
and they didn't later catch smallpox. So he thought if he inoculated a person with a version of the smallpox that was weaker, they would survive it because your bodies had already fought it. Because cowpox and smallpox are related. And then we have Louis Pasteur comes up with germ theory. Germ theory states that microorganisms known as pathogens or germs can lead to disease. These small organisms, too small to be seen without a magnifi mag magnification, sorry, invade a human and other living hosts and their growth and reproduction within their hosts can cause disease. I know to you, you're probably thinking, uh, duh, except there was a time when nobody knew these things. So this is pretty revolutionary. There are some other things here. We're going to have a project at a certain point that we'll go over these. So you're going to have time to learn about all of these different inventions. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell's got the telephone. Henry Ford's got the assembly line. Thomas Edison's got the light bulb, although that could be, you know, iffy. Uh, we've got Bessemer in the steel making process. The Wright brothers with the airplane wings. So kind of a big deal. All right, so how did it change society? Well, first one, urbanization. People are going to start moving to the cities to start looking for work. So your cities are going to grow exponentially. This, of course, is going to lead to pollution and poverty, crime, and public health crises because of dirty cities and disease is spreading. There are housing shortages, and because of the mass amount of people, there's not enough housing, and what there is is not sufficient to hold the people that move into the cities. Another result is the changing roles of women and children. Kids were small. They have small fingers, and they could work machines and stick their fingers in small little holes, which adults couldn't do, and they were cheap. Women start to also hold jobs outside the home for the first time. But this is primarily poor women, where middle-class women could actually go home and focus on child development. Another effect is the new social classes that come out. You have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. There's basically the rich, the bourgeoisie, and the poor, which is the proletariat. So people start to feel pushed out of their jobs by the machines. So you have like this new group that emerges, and they're called the Luddites. They actually take this belief to an extreme and actually attack and destroy factories. If you're going, well, why do I have to know about the Luddites? This is just one of the reactions to the Industrial Revolution. So there are some positive impacts. There are the technological advancements. Some people actually have an increase in their standard of living, manufacturing methods advance, and consumer goods are easier to come by. There's more variety in them, and they're more affordable. So life does actually get easier. I mean, think about it. Today, life is so much easier because of the Industrial Revolution than it was pre-Industrial Revolution. But what goes up must come down. We have negative impacts as well. There's a growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots. The poor's working conditions were even getting worse, and the colonies that still existed were still getting exploited. Nothing's changing with that. So we've got some economic changes. We have capitalism. We talked about mercantilism. Now we're going to do capitalism. This is an economic system in which the factors of production are owned privately, and money is invested in business ventures to make a profit. It's something known as laissez-faire, if I totally butchered that, which means like let them alone, which means limited government intervention. Remember, mercantilism is basically abandoned in favor of this free trade policies and capitalism. This comes from Adam Smith, and he has his book called The Wealth of Nations. He wrote about competition and the fact that we are driven by self-interest and the motive to make profits. There are natural forces, he says, for supply and demand, and that they should operate without government interference. Those that are efficient will make more profit, they'll hire more workers, and they will expand helping everyone. Basically, it's in your self-interest to make a good business, because if you don't treat your workers well, they'll quit. That's the idea. They'll quit, they'll go work for someone else. That's capitalism. This will lead to large-scale transnational businesses. This is a commercial enterprise that operates substantial facilities and does business in more than one country. This relies on new banking practices like stock markets. This is what we have today. You'll want to know about Unilever. This is one of those companies you'll want to know about, and HSBC. So, of course, this is going to lead to reform. Everything that comes up as a new idea will always have some type of opposing force that's going to bump into it. So we have labor unions. They come out as a result of all this inequality and harsh working conditions. 
these are voluntary labor associations that will represent all workers in a particular trade. So think of it like coal workers or teacher unions. They take part in collective bargaining negotiations between the workers and the management. They encourage strikes to demand an increase in wages and improve worker conditions. Labor unions, the folks who brought you the weekend, child labor laws, overtime, minimum wage, injury protection, workmen's compens compensation insurance, pension security, the right to organize, etc. Think about it. All these wonderful things you have in jobs today, you didn't used to have. There were a lot of jobs you have today where you get to have a break. You don't have a break back in the day. We have that because of labor unions. Socialism. The rise of capitalism is going to lead to the rise of socialism. The definition of socialism is an inequality and injustice for the consequences of the Industrial Revolution. And strong government regulations, which is the direct control of industries, was needed to protect workers from predatory actions of employers. Remember how we talked about capitalism and this idea that it's in the best interest of like the manager to treat their employers right? Fortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you have a great manager, sometimes you have a terrible manager. And as such, they thought capitalism wasn't working, let's drift over to socialism. So we've got this political spectrum. In the middle, when you hear about politics today, you've got liberals and conservatives. Well, if you go left of liberalism, you have socialism. You go a little bit more left, you have communism. You go even more left, you've got anarchism. Anarchism, sorry. Conservatism, you go a little bit right, you have monarchism. Go even more right, you have Nazism. Go even more right, you got fascism. Whew, crazy. Communism, ain't no party like a communist party. So Karl Marx writes something called the Communist Manifesto with Friedrich Engels in 1848. Adherents call themselves Marxists or communists. They believe that like the exploitation of capitalism, the haves and the have-nots, would lead to a revolution that would end capitalism and create a dictatorship of the proletariat. So once accomplished, workers would distribute material benefits to the society in general. They thought this would get rid of private property. It would harness society's resources to end poverty and injustice. In theory, this is a wonderful idea. In practice, not so much. Now we have anarchism. This is a revolutionary alternative to communism. This is when you're really, really going off. They thought Marxist proletariat government would be inherently oppressive because all government is. They thought revolution could be achieved quickly. Essentially, they were totally getting rid of all government. That's anarchy. That's what they wanted. Assassinations and bombings. So you should probably look at William McKinley of the United States. It's kind of a big deal. Get assassinated. All right. It's time to go to Japan. So if you're going to read this, especially if you use the AMSCO tax, you're, uh, you are going to read this. But uh, for approximately 350 years, Japan had very little contact with the outside world. However, imperialism was rearing its ugly head, and it was not going to allow Japan to stay by itself for much longer. So this is where we get Commodore Matthew Perry. He steps in. He's asking for trade privileges. He demands with more ships the second time he comes back. And because the Japanese see all this U.S. power, they relent and allow trade with the United States. Soon, they do this with the other nations as well. This treaty angers the Japanese, who thought they would become powerless, colonized people. However, this is going to lead to change and essentially westernization. These Japanese people would go off and visit Europe and the U.S. and start to adopt the reforms based on what they see. 1867, for example, the Tokugawa shogun steps down and ends 600 years of military dictatorship. And the emperor, uh, Matsuhito, takes control of the government and took the title, um, I'm going to butcher that, Miji, Mihei, I'm just going to not say it. It means enlightened rule. So the restoration. Uh, they start industrialization. They end feudalism. They model their government and army on Germany's. They abolish cruel punishments. They create a new school system. They build railroads and roads. And they turn Japan into Asia's industrial leader. This is something you might want to pause at some point and just kind of write it down, kind of get an idea as to what the heck they do. Fantastic things. They do a lot of great things for Japan. I mean, Japan goes a little off in the 1900s, and that's okay. You know, every country has their flaws. Just good to know. This little about print though is kind of interesting. Um, it shows how this is the Japanese, by the way, on the left hand side. This is supposed to be the Japanese. They see themselves similar to the Westerners. 
the Westerners are these people back here, and these are the Chinese. So the Japanese are now seeing themselves like Westerners, not like the Asian people that they are right by. So this is stuff that we're going to learn next unit. Uh, Japan's victories over Russia. They actually gained Manchuria in the 1900s, and they fight with Korea. They start to grow into a, a regional power. They surge with nationalism in the 30s and 40s, and that becomes a focal point of World War II. So let me get to the next, not not unit six, it's seven. Let's see, seven. It's going to be a bit of a mess. Eh, nationalism when it gets a little ugly. All right, Ottomans, industrialization. So Ottomans went in all the fun. It's just that they don't succeed like the Japanese do, unfortunately. There is this leader, though. His name is Muhammad Ali, not to be confused with the boxer. He was an Albanian Ottoman officer who rose to prominence, and he becomes the new governor of Egypt. The sultan basically was like, okay, you can do what you want. He's actually able to act independently of the sultan, and he only joins the sultan's military campaign, campaigns when it suits him. And sometimes he just starts fights with other countries without telling the sultan. He actually started to make over the country's military based on the European model and sent his military officers to be educated in France. And in fact, started the first official newspaper in the Islamic world. He pushed Egypt to industrialize. So he's kind of a really big deal. Um, here you go. We, Ali was forced to eliminate all import taxes by the British. Um, he is considered, again, the founder of the modern Egyptian state. So he ends the Mamluk influence for the area. And that's it. I'll go back up. This is the last slide. This is it, guys. This is a much shorter PowerPoint. Of course, last time we did two units, A, B units, three, and four. So this is it. You want to know this, all these revolutions. Hopefully this helped you. And if not, you know, we're always there for tutoring. Uh, I hope this helped. And if not, just uh, send us an email. All right, have a great day.